All right, let's join together in prayer. Our Lord Jesus Christ, magnify your holy name. May we perceive glory from Psalm 72 as we look upon it as a mirror to showcase your magnificence. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, what is God's ideal king like? What are his attributes? What is his, is his rule like? What's his character? Psalm 72 is a vision of the ideal king. Here we see uh, in the subscription there, this is of Solomon. Some have been confused by this because verse 20, as we read earlier, says the prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. What that is, is a marker that that's the end of book two. But we have no reason to believe that all the Psalms in that section, maybe verses one uh, chapters 1 through 72 would be of David because we have Asaph and sons of Korah and now of Solomon. So it's better to see that this is of Solomon, that is written by Solomon, and it is a coronation psalm. So he is praying not only for himself as the now new king, the successor of David, the royal son, but also for subsequent kings to follow, that they would have something to be able to read and pray for their king. What's so amazing about this psalm itself, though, and as many of the psalms are, is their prayers and petitions, but they're not petitions based on sort of like a, a random desire of the person or something based on like a worldly philosophy or atheistic understanding of the world. No. All these petitions are always based upon the revealed promises and laws of God so that their prayers are full of Scripture from prior generations. So we're not surprised when Solomon here talks about this ideal king as one who would be an Adam figure, who would have dominion over all of creation or that he would be the serpent crusher from John, uh, Genesis 3.15. Or he would be the, like the one promised to Abraham, a son who would bring blessing, not only a, a great name for himself, but blessing to the nations. And he would be the son promised to David, whose kingdom would extend without boundary and be ongoing for generation to generation, forever. So that as he's praying for the king, the ideal king, it would look like the revealed redeemer who has been promised. And so in that case, as he's praying for himself and for all these other kings, it actually becomes a picture of the Messiah, the long-promised redeemer of his people who would be the king in the line of David. And so this psalm has been historically interpreted messianically, not only by Christian scholars, but Jewish as well. So they were saying, okay, the one promised in 2 Samuel 7, the Davidic king is going to look like this, and this is what his rule will look like, a just king who serves the needy. And when that king arrived initially, those who were familiar with the Old Testament missed it. They didn't see in this Jesus of Nazareth the promised ruler in the line of David who would come as a compassionate, empathetic, and just ruler who would defeat his enemies. They saw an imposter. They saw in him someone who was not coming to overthrow the tyrannical Roman government, as we see this king kind of depicted in the Old Testament. They saw somebody who was coming in meekness and humility, but Jesus was telling them all along, his kingdom is not of this world, and it looks different. And so in this first coming, he came in grace. And so he came meek, like a shepherd, like one who was going to be mistreated and reviled. But he would eventually come in glory to consummate his kingdom, of which we see a picture of here. So today, when we read Psalm 72, we see in it, the fulfillment, the consummation of what Christ has promised all along, a new heavens and a new earth. And so that's how we will interpret 
This psalm together, it is for Solomon, but it finds its greater fulfillment in the Lord Jesus. And we can pray this psalm as well, just like the church has done for 2,000 years when they say, Lord Jesus, come. We are praying and longing for that messianic kingdom to come in its fulfillment. So we're going to look at five prayerful longings for Messiah's kingdom. Equity, endurance, expansion, empathy, and eminence. Let's get right into the first prayerful longing for Messiah's kingdom. We see in these first four verses this emphasis upon righteousness, equity. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. May his rule look and reflect the character of God himself, who is just and righteous. And to what end? Verse 2, may he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. The poor here, or could be translated afflicted, are those who have no social standing, who have no ability to uh, basically have people serve them and then gain influence and status, so oftentimes they are then marginalized or even oppressed. These are those who have been neglected. Kings oftentimes would be the first to overlook these people, but not the ideal king who has his eye towards those who could be oppressed. Verse 3, let the mountains bear prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness, a poetic vision of prosperity, even from the mountaintops where there usually isn't growth, hills abounding in righteousness. The land itself is no longer stained and blemished by unrighteousness. Instead, covenant breakers are removed. Sin is done away with. Curses are relinquished. Peace flourishes. Verse 4, may he defend the cause of the poor of the people. Give deliverance to the children of the needy and crush the oppressors. That's the job of the ruler, is to reward those who do good, but to punish those who do evil. And to, as Proverbs speaks of, speak up for those who have no voice. The just king, the just ruler, acknowledges the brokenness of this world and seeks to make things right. Notice this language here, crush the oppressor. It's the same verb used for crushing the head of the serpent from Genesis 3.15. The greatest oppressor is Satan himself who blinds the minds of unbelievers, who ensnares people, who is the father of lies and now has all unbelievers following in his sway, which bringing about destruction and corruption in this world. Ultimately, finally, Jesus Christ will return and finally cast off that evil oppressor, Satan himself. The victory has been won at the cross, but we await the final casting of that evil being into the lake of fire. So we have here Psalm 72 a vision, a picture into the coming kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw it, pictures of it when he came in the Gospels. And what what did he do but show himself to be one particularly concerned for righteousness and justice? It's a beautiful picture of which we should long for. This world is riddled with unrighteousness. See it every day, a world filled with, what, war crimes? We have children being torn from their mother's womb, the place of safety and nourishment. We have confusion surrounding what is true in terms of gender, so people are influencing, influencing the youngest among us to question God's design for them. We have abominations just all over. Those things that God deems evil are being praised and celebrated, even in the used terms like pride, 
to celebrate these things. No, may it never be. May Christ return in glory and right the wrongs of this world so that oppression would be finally snuffed out. We have the second prayerful longing for a Messiah's kingdom, endurance. Verse 5, may they fear you while the sun endures and as long as the moon throughout all generations. This is the l- length of his, his reign. We know that the length of a person's reign determines how prosperous that country will be because of the stability that a good king can provide. For this king, may it endure forever from moon to moon. Verse 7 says, and may it be till the moon be no more. Longevity is what the prayer is for, which is the foundation of prosperity and blessing, which we see in verse 6. May he be like rain that falls on the mown grass like showers that water the earth, the parched land, the dry... We're in the drought right now. We see what water does to the grass and flowers. They flourish and they grow. This is similarly described in 2 Samuel 23. When one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God, he dawns on them like the morning light, like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. Oh, this is beautiful. And so in... Verse 6 here, continuing into 7, we have watering and sun and nourishment. And look what flourishes, righteousness. In his days may the righteous flourish, peace abound. All of it grows from the just rule of the king, leading his people to love righteousness and goodness. That is the role of the king in his influence. And that is what Christ Jesus does in our lives. As the head of the church, we see and obey his his laws, and we flourish, growing in righteousness and holiness. And may it be till the moon be no more, verse 7. That is, in essence, Psalm is praying that this would endure this kingdom from generation to generation forever and ever. May there never be another succession of a fallen king or a son who's no longer good. May it be Christ, the king, enduring forever and ever As Daniel foretold, Christ's dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Daniel 7, 14. Not only are there longings for equity, endurance, but third, it's expansion here. Verse 8, may he have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. The extent of the kingdom has no boundaries. This is the exact language of the Abrahamic covenant, the promise that he would have a land. So this is the the river and the Euphrates and the sea to sea. These these are like boundaries that would hearken back to, okay, promised land, promised land. But it doesn't say up to the Euphrates. It says out from the Euphrates or out from the river to the ends of the earth. That's the expansion of Christ's kingdom that has no boundaries. And that's why in the New Testament, you don't have a hearkening back to the promise of the, pra- the promised land. It's not even mentioned because what we are waiting is a new heavens and a new earth. The promised land was typological. It was speaking and giving you a vision or a picture of what glorious new creation would be like. They had a land, boundaries, a king over that would rule and they would live in supposedly a just society. But all that was pointing forward to the new creation in which righteousness dwells. A king over his people who live in peace and harmony. And that is what we are awaiting. The new heavens and the new earth. Well, the kingdom is universal in that it has no boundaries, but it's also universal in who it includes. All nations and all peoples. Not all people, but all peoples. Verse 9, may desert tribes bow down before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and of the coastlands render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all kings fall down before him. All nations serve him. And these are things they're saying, well, is this really what Solomon is praying for himself? That he'd be the king of all nations and his glory would spread out all over all the all the earth? 
No, this is way beyond what Solomon could ever imagine. And so he's speaking prophetically of what we should see in the Christ himself. Desert tribes, that is far away nations, will come and bow down. Kings of Tarshish, coastlands, Sheba, Seba, all kings, everybody bowing to the Lord Jesus Christ. This was somewhat fulfilled in Solomon's life when we think of the Queen of Sheba. And what did she say? The report was true that I heard in my own land of your words and of your wisdom. And behold, the half was not told me. She heard of his glory, his majesty of the kingdom. If that was true of Solomon, how much more true of Christ and his kingdom? How much more will we say half was not told of me? I couldn't believe what we're experiencing in a righteous, ruling, flourishing land of the Lord Jesus Christ. We saw a glimpse of these verses in Jesus' life when the wise men or the kings of other places, you might say, brought him gifts at his birth. But it will be far, far superior when he returns in glory and all kings, all nations will bow. Notice in verse 9, there's two mentions of submission here, two ways in which people will bow. Verse 9, may desert tribes bow down before him and enemies lick the dust. To lick the dust, you must bow. And so what he's saying here is there are going to be people who will bow willingly in adoration, recognizing his magnificence, and there will be enemies who will be forced in submission to lick the dust and bow before the king. And we see this clearly depicted of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Apostle Paul. When he writes, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is a coming day when the scriptures speak of all Christ's enemies being placed in submission to him, bowing in adoration, adoration, acknowledging the sovereignty of the king. You have to ask yourself now, who am I? Who do I want to be? If the scriptures depict Christ coming in glory and everyone standing before him, will I be one forced into submission or will I gladly and happily receive and adore my king? That takes place now in this life. And if you're at a point where saying, wow, I'm... I've actually rejected this king my entire life. I've actually not followed his ways. I've not observed his commandments. I've, in fact, spoken against him. And you're feeling the weight of the fact that this is the king, the ruler, the just judge of all the universe. You can do what others in the scriptures have actually done, which call out, what must I do to be saved? And when that question is asked, those who know the truth... Don't blink. They don't hesitate. They say, call upon the name of the Lord. Believe in the name of Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And to believe in him is to consider everything he's ever said about himself, whatever's depicted of him in the scriptures as true and to trust it. And then also to bow in submission to his lordship and to say, I will follow you. That is what Christ's kingship looks like. And you enter into his kingdom through faith and trust in him, repenting of your sins, saying, I'm now one of your citizens. And you receive the mark of one of his citizens. You get your passport stamped, which is baptism. And you become an ambassador of the king through his kingdom assembly here on earth. And you eat the food of the kingdom, the Lord's Supper, together and you follow his ways, and you push back against darkness in this world as a redeemed citizen of his kingdom. So, who are you today? Are you a follower of this king in expectant hope of him bringing the consummated kingdom? Fourth, the fourth prayerful longing is empathy. We long for a kingdom that is filled with empathy, for a king who 
is compassionate. Verse 12, for he delivers the needy when he calls the poor and him who has no helper. He has pity on the weak and the needy and saves the lives of the needy. From oppression and violence, he redeems their life and precious is their blood in his sight. It's typical of great kings to be so concerned about their own desires, building projects, that they end up neglecting those who need the most help. That was true of Solomon as well. If you read the story in 1 Kings, he actually becomes a great oppressor of lowly people in Israel and forces them into virtual slavery for building his projects. By contrast, Christ declares, come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. He is gentle and lowly. And so as we study the gospel, you you see a difference in this king. He's, He's like no one you've ever met who has great strength and power and can command people with his voice in his teaching authoritatively. And yet he was so compassionate. You think of blind Bartimaeus, that story. Have mercy on me, son of David, have mercy on me. And then Luke's account says he stopped and he turned and went to him and did all that the man asked of him. We see it time and time again, meeting the needs of the widows, the orphans, the raising of the dead, the healing people who were bound in disease and infirmities. This is him, the empathetic king who graciously saves his people. But all of that points forward to the greatest work he was going to do of empathy when he saw us in our sinful misery, in rebellion against him, those who were dead in our trespasses and sins, ensnared to devil's devices, following him, lover of evil, as Paul talks about, haters of one another, hating ourselves, everything. It was a big, fat mess in Jesus came into that. And so Romans actually says very clearly that it was while we were weak that Christ died for the ungodly. And so he looked upon us with compassion and empathy and he came and said, I will take you to myself. And that love continues even today. If you have fallen into sin, if you have turned from your beloved Savior and his ways, you come back to him and say, forgive me, forgive me. And he's compassionate and empathetic. And then he applies afresh the new covenant forgiveness of sins, which is a promise that he's given to you that he will remember your sins no more. Oh, what a Savior. What a Savior. But we also long for the day when this king will be in present in his fullness and will demonstrate this empathy all the time because currently we are experiencing such hostility and oppression and evil and persecution in this world. We have to remind ourselves that, oh yeah, okay, we're in a very Christianized kind of Western world where has been influenced for generations so that there's still some sense of justice and people aren't being persecuted at the level. But all over the world, people are longing for this empathetic return of Christ to establish justice for the needy and to help in that new heavens and new earth. Well, that brings us now to our final prayerful longing of this psalm. It's eminence or renown or reputation or fame, desirous of the king to receive what is properly due. Verse 15, long may he live. Verse 17, may his name endure forever. His fame continue as long as the sun. May people be blessed in him. All nations call him blessed. As the psalmist prays here, long may he live We pray that for the Lord Jesus Christ, but we know for certain God has already raised him from the dead to eternal living in dominion. He cannot perish. He is immortal, as Hebrews 1, 8 through 12, speaking the Messiah says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. They will perish, but you remain. You are the same, and your years will have no end. 
And verse 15 continues, May gold of Sheba be given to him, all sorts of riches and pomp and status. May prayer be made for him continually and blessings invoked for him all the day. May your kingdom come, Lord Jesus Christ. Come and rule and reign magnificently from sea to sea. We see Solomon's treasury was enriched with gold from Sheba, from the queen there. He had earthly treasures. He had a majestic palace and all these things. But Christ has everything. He rules. He owns everything. But what is most particularly precious to him and his inheritance is the people to whom he purchased. That's what the scriptures describe us as, an inheritance to him. And it says his prayers are desired and blessings invoked all the day. Verse 16, may there be abundance of grain in the land. On the tops of the mountains may it wave. May its fruit be like Lebanon. And may people blossom in the cities like the grass of the field. Prosperity, abundance, shalom, the peace that is so described of the new heavens and the new earth. That is what we are longing for, of which Christ will bring. Verse 17, may his name endure forever. His fame continue as long as the sun. That this would not end, but be something forever. Something we can't even fathom, because we only think in successive moments and things always coming to an end. But an eternal kingdom of blessing that only the Lord Jesus Christ can bring about. May people be blessed in him. All nations call him blessed. This is Solomon recalling the promise made to Abraham that through him God would make him a great name and all the nations would be blessed in him. That is then reiterated to David that he would have a house and that his kingdom would go forever and ever and all the nations would be blessed through him. So Psalm 72 is the pinnacle of Old Testament theology. It's all coming together. All the weaving, the revelation of who would be the seed, the promised one, comes to its fulfillment in this promised ideal king whose reign would be of justice and righteousness, whose dominion would extend from sea to sea, whose duration would go on for generation upon generation, forever and ever of eternal blessedness. That is what we see in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we praise him, which all leads to this doxology, verse 18. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. We could go throughout all the scriptures and talk about all the wondrous things God's done and creating in six days and saving his people through the exodus and all the wondrous things plagues and the saving through the Passover and bringing him out to the new creation, but none of them pale in comparison to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, whom he brought about redemption through his life, death, and resurrection, ascends to the right hand and seat sits now, and his work is being done in this world, expanding his kingdom through the church where he now is ruling as we submit and obey his commands and enjoy his blessed presence through his Holy Spirit. But we await his return in glory when he will set all things right and we will dwell in a place called righteousness because it will be led and ruled by the Psalm 72 King of Righteousness. Let's pray. Our glorious God, we thank you so much for such kindness in revealing to us so clearly whom the Lord Jesus Christ was to be, is, and will do in his return. We thank you that we, although now live in a fallen place, have such hope and expectation of all things being renewed under his reigning kingdom. We thank you that you were gracious to us and allowed us to enter by uh, the way in which was given to us through the proclamation of the gospel. The way was paved through our Lord Jesus Christ, through his suffering and death and resurrection. And now we fall, we follow him in sub suffering now. 
We know that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom. So we pray you'd keep us, Lord, sustain us. May we be patient in well-doing and continue to follow our Lord through all the trials of this life. And with this great prayerful longing of his return, may it steady our eyes upon the future and have present blessings and responsibilities now. May we take those up in our calling as a church to make disciples and to live together as a church, a renewed people who can show all that's described here in this psalm of righteous living, of sharing with the poor, and as the rich have all things in common with the poor, and we do what this psalm is meant to do forever and ever, live in harmony and unity under our King. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.